What's up, everyone? Thanks for tuning in to Cannabis Legalization News, where we explain marijuana laws so you can change them. Today, we're joined by Queen Adesui from the Drug Policy Alliance. We're going to be talking about the uh, MORE Act and federal legalization and local initiatives. But first, we do need to get into a little bit of cannabis legalization news. That's the big news today or this week. But how are y'all doing? What else is in the news? Well, I mean, like, yeah, that that was in the news so much that here we are sitting at 9183. Nice. Uh, that we could, we went live on Friday, and by now it's already been viewed over thirteen thousand times. So we went over the full Moore Acts uh, passage, and then we discussed how it was ninety-seven or something like that percent. If you are a Republican, you voted against it, and then there was just like a handful that didn't. And if you were a Democrat, you voted for it, and there's just a handful that didn't. And give us a like, give us a subscribe, and stick around until the end of the news summary to find out which one of those negative. Uh, Democrat voters uh, he has gotten money from me. Oh, shit. <laughs> well, and, hey, I like to donate to politicians. And I recommend that watch our video because I thought we did some great sexy play-by-play -play action there with the the, the, stuff, the whole house going oh, on wow. there. <laughs> yep. Know, yep. So and sexy. I mean, it kicked off all sorts of news that's getting in on there. And so uh, it was another thing that happened uh, just this morning. Uh, uh, another bill came through the House, way less fanfare, but still uh, House approves marijuana research bill days after voting to federally legalize cannabis. So another bill has made it out of, of the House. I mean, this is like how many bills have made it out of the House now? Three. And these are just gestures, though, right? Because, I mean, it still has to go through the Senate. It's still oh, hell. That's something that came when we've we been talking about this. Has to go through the Senate, all of that. And what does the Senate have on the line? Uh, Early voting starts uh, on December 14th. Oh, yeah. Roth, George, did you see that How, in Georgia where he debated a chair, an empty chair? Do you know what the polls are? So the, I, I've seen some polls. I set it over to 538.com. And right now, John Ossoff is beating Mr. Purdue. Uh, 48 to 6 to 48 to just flip a coin. And this Purdue guy is like under investigation, maybe indictment. And he didn't even go to the debate. Dude, I'm just saying like that makes you look bad. It, yeah. I, and I, then, I, uh, yeah. But then it's the other one is Warnock versus Loeffler. And the Warnock be, appears to be up by two. And so, again, early voting starts in Georgia in uh, December 14th. So next week, start voting. And, and, you know, it, it, maybe what's going to happen, the same thing happened last time. I mean, I don't know. I'm just glad that I'm not in Georgia to see all those gosh darn political ads. What do they say? Like over half a billion is being spent on just, you know, if we get this Senate, if the Democrats get to there's no we. It's just the well, Democrats. I'm right. independent. But anyways, uh, but I think we get the Senate. Legalization is so close. Legalization is so close. Thumbs ups and 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 no, well, I was going to say subscribe because that's one of the ways that you get subscribers. You ask for them, but then you know share this with somebody who needs to, you know, share this with your elected officials that don't didn't vote for the gosh darn more act because that is just frustrating as heck. Hey man, what was one of those stories that you were just uh, telling me about before we came on? Well, and I, I forgot to tell you, and I forgot to mention it in the green room is uh, Rich Delisi was released. Oh my after, gosh, that's huge news. Rich after thirty one years. Now, I'm not sure if that guy, if we can get him to come on the show, that would be a fantastic Sunday show. Rich Delisi, the longest serving cannabis uh, prisoner, right? Well, yeah, at that time. But you know what's funny, as I was thinking about this morning, is COVID has released more prisoners than both Obama and Trump. Like COVID. Uh, I'm just saying, uh, uh, Antonio Vascara, you know, longest serving prisoner at the time. Then Craig Cecil, the longest serving prisoner at the time. And now Richard Delisi. The longest possible. Like, are Can we, we get the publicists? Do they have publicists? We should have them on the show. They're like, it's a perfect Sunday show, you know? Three perfect Sunday shows. It just kills me that it takes this pandemic to finally release older, sick people behind bars. You know, it just, you know, the prison's atmosphere, the healthcare is not the best. You're almost sentenced to a death sentence if you're not, if you're older, you know? Older. Well, you know, we had both the D'Angelo brothers on, and you've been an activist since day one, at least according to your lower third that we have on this podcast. And so uh, if let's reach out to the D'Angelo brothers. And, you know, uh, it was the last prisoner project helped uh, negotiate and facilitate a lot of these releases and see if we can get uh, the victims on the show so they can talk about how they need to end uh, marijuana prohibition and they need to let the people out of prison. But man, what was that uh, that story you were telling me about the firefighters? Oh my God! So 
uh, what was it in uh, West Virginia? Firefighters uh, uh, knocked out a guy after seeing plants in his backyard. I mean, if the Moore Act passes, this will not be an issue. He will not be a criminal. Yeah, but they said it's Fairmont, West Virginia. Fairmont, West Virginia man been charged after deputies found nearly 700 marijuana plants and 300 grams of packed marijuana when they were called to the scene of a brush fire where wildfires identified the growing site. 700 plants outdoor, though. Wait, that can't be 700 plants outdoor. It's December 8th. I don't care if it is West Virginia. Shit. Well... I mean, it could have been 700 clones for all we know. You know? Well, it still was probably a, like a, maybe a light to have greenhouse, maybe some type of indoor operation. But how did they get aware of it? I mean, like there's a brush fire. So when I hear brush fire, I think outdoor grow, but it's December 8th. So no way. Well, you know, what, what is it? A firefighter would be like, I, I think I smell weed. I mean, yeah, but we should, still, I mean, like that's one of those things they aren't supposed to be narking on that. And then um, they're doing it because it's illegal. Of exactly. course, then if it was legal, they would have been like, hey, yeah, here's my license. I pay taxes. You're supposed to just put out fires, not get me ar arrested. Well, and I know like with the Morak going through, it's still going to be a state by state basis. But wouldn't he be less of a criminal? Like if he they turn him in, is right. he still going to go to jail or is it just a fine at that point? I don't know, but it's not all that bad. I mean, like right close to uh, West Virginia is a state called Pennsylvania and Pennsylvania's lieutenant governor has penned a, an opinion letter to the Washington Post, Washington Post publicized it or published it, get with the program, period, legalize weed, period. I wonder where he stands on this issue. And so uh, John Fetterman's a Democrat and the lieutenant governor of Pennsylvania and is just stating, you know, no full stop, we need to legalize Pennsylvania. I hope that it is the uh, the the SB 350 on uh, SB 350. You can find a whole bunch of that on our website, uh, cannabisindustrylawyer.com. And if you're looking to get into the industry because of one of these new states that have come online, go to our Get Started page. We just updated our intake procedures. So this will integrate with our CRM. You know what a CRM is, right, Miggy? Not a clue. It's a customer relations management software thing. I'm a techie guy. I'm a hardware guy. Like I, I fix things. I don't paperwork. Fix things. Paperwork, Paper man. Yep. And so uh, yeah, that, that that's going. And then it's going to be interesting to see how Pennsylvania is because now you have. We have to see what the makeup of their legislature is. Remember, we did have uh, the senator who sponsored the bill, who I think didn't win, though. So it's going to be a new bill. It won't be 350. Hopefully, it's substantially like 350. And we have to find and listen to uh, uh, our people in Pennsylvania and then see what the bill looks like. And another state that the bill is like starting to come you know, a little bit more into focus is New Jersey. Oh, um, yeah. Yeah. And they're they're worried that the way that they're setting it up will encourage and they still do it here. They call it the black market tax. Cannabis tax will encourage black market New Jersey real uh, retailers, say, in their opinion. And so um, the black market, yeah, any of this, dude, any of this uh, legalization. Right. It, yeah. it seems to be there's always this weird pissing contest among people like uh, it's us versus them. There always has to be a like with the more act passing. Like, how are these people mad, activists, and, and upset? And I understand it's not the most perfect bill, but have you tried passing any legislation? It's fucked up. And I bet you Queen can tell us this. Oh, yeah. We're going to have her on here in the in a bit, but yeah. uh, it's going to be interesting to see how New Jersey's uh, take, uh, you know, take comes out. And we're going to we're, we're watching that more closely because I think last week they actually filed uh, another bill. And so we're going to have an understanding of what the New Jersey rubric to regulate cannabis in that state is going to look like. And then we're going to create more content over at, of course, Cannabis Industry Lawyer and so that we can then figure out uh more stuff that we can help them with anyway oh. um have you ever heard of congressman uh, sorry congresswoman sherry bustos no all right well um i have i've been to her fundraisers and oh, uh, it, so she knows our family we've been longtime democrats in the central illinois area and so sherry bustos has voted against legalizing marijuana and so she's she's out of moline now this this might be one of those um things because like Illinois has been shrinking for a while uh, population wise. So either Sherry Bustos or uh, Darren LaHood, who are the two local uh, representatives, 
there might only be one because like Illinois hasn't grown. So they might lose a, a congressional rep because it is it's a proportional thing. And that's uh, something we're going to be talking about because the House of Representatives, besides Sherry Bustos, voted to pass the Moore Act. Oh, yeah. Besides Sherry. And what? Ninety seven percent Republicans. And look, before people start like bitching about like trashy Republicans, you know, Democrats are just as shitty here in Washington state. They stopped home grow. Like, let's just call them out where they're at. Right now, it's the Republicans in the national conversation, you know, period. Yep. Yep. I just don't get it. And I don't see any quote on her on this at all. But uh, I'm not happy about it. She was one of only six Democrats who voted against the bill. It's too bad. I'm never going to give to her uh, her political campaigns anymore. Do you think uh, Big Marijuana was paying her not to pay? Or was uh, Big Pharma paying her not to vote? I mean, well, I don't know, but I tell you one thing. Why am I wearing this suit? Because I actually went to Zoom court today. I got out of my last piece of litigation. I no longer have any pending litigation nice. before any court that I'm aware of. Well, until what, next year when uh, uh, all the start rules start coming out? And then well, I, I don't know. I mean, I might, I might have a litigator on staff, and then I would read their briefs and say, check this. I don't think that's how it is. And then, uh, and then somebody else would have to deal with it. And I would just do deals from a beach. Is that how that works? Uh, corporate work is different than litigation work. That's, that is a thing. Corporate work is different than litigation work. Yeah. Well, I mean, like talking to queen earlier, she was talking about how she's getting paid to help change the world, which I think is, she's that is the best freaking awesome. fucking job. Yeah. She's getting paid to like help people. Yeah. I like to think that I'm helping people, helping people oh, find yeah. weed. That's helping. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's bring Queen on. Hey, Queen, thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, you're on mute. Hey, y'all. Thank you for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Sweet. Can you, you tell us a little bit about what you're doing at the Drug Policy Alliance? Yeah, so my name is Queen Adesui, and I'm a policy manager with the Drug Policy Alliance um, in our national affairs office in DC, but I'm a native New Yorker. Um, I was a part of leadership around getting the Act to the floor that um, which passed last week. Um, I handle our marijuana policy. I co-lead it with Maritza Perez, our director. Um, and I also work locally in DC. Uh, so DC, the uh, District of Columbia around marijuana reform and overdose prevention. How long did it take you guys to like come together and say, hey, this is it. This is the, this is the piece of paper, the packet that we all agree upon. Because as you see now, there's a lot of disgruntled activists or people in the industry out there. I mean, how do you address that? This was a long time coming. Like we worked to convene the Marijuana Justice Coalition, which is the coalition that really was uh, instrumental in getting this bill to the floor. Um, it includes DPA, ACLU, Normal, uh, Just Leadership USA, so formerly incarcerated groups, immigrant legal rights groups. Um, and we worked to build this bill from mm -hmm. the inception. The intention was always for it to be comprehensive. We always acknowledged the fact that prohibition really had detrimental harm on communities and individuals and you know the reform that would end prohibition would need to be as comprehensive as the harm that it's caused so we really wanted it to not just be a descheduling bill we wanted it to be separate and different than the states act on um, which a lot of folks like to rally around and think that you know we should have been pushing the states act no 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 <laughs> yeah. here here at the, not to not to cut you out but like here at this channel i have been railing against its constitutionality since day one i'm like this is stupid I'm let me tell you why. <laughs> <laughs> um but i mean we want the, reform but yeah. it should be good reform absolutely good reform and i also like it to be effective reform and so like the give back on the people that have definitely been harmed one of the the aspects that i wanted to ask your opinion on this because i think you have a lot more legislative understanding and knowledge than i do of the process and there are like separation of powers and whatnot but mm -hmm. is it is it within congress's power to issue a tax disgorgement to the irs to make them cough up the 280 e money that they've gotten for the past decade yeah, so the Congress is not going to account for how they've recklessly been basically stealing from legal companies. Yeah. Um, but I think the important part is how descheduling is has to be a cornerstone of reform because that actually would fix the 280 problem. It will allow businesses to be recognized as the businesses that they are. Um, so they can take tax breaks and do the things that normal businesses do. Um, but the only way to do that is to descheduled. So the States Act really is, and even, and even the banking bill. 
um, the Even big the bill bill. Bill. is a yeah. band aid, really. Yeah. And then that's the problem because I figured if you dangled like billions of dollars in front of these cannabis companies and said, now go write your congressman, we've put this line item into the Moore Act, cut some checks, talk about Sherry Bustos. What the heck, Sherry? I, I told you <laughs> you vote for weed numerous times. Yeah. You would be surprised, but I would I would think the messaging and the, the way we've, you know, strategized around this bill, it's really the racial justice and the economic justice pieces that move the bill to where we sit now. It really has not been a public industry. Um, a lot of ways they have they've been helpful in members, but in the majority, you know, this Democratic caucus, it really was the messaging around the implementation that got us this far. No, totally. Like the origins of prohibition itself. I right. mean but you know, right now there's even the, the like the minority business association. Uh, Jesse Horton is against mm -hmm. uh, and I, I just don't get. To me, this whole thing, like as an activist, I you know I'm not in the business. I don't do anything. But it's like it's about not going to fucking jail. It's it. Yeah. It's about. Okay, yeah. Look, Tom has always said about the 280e money, and, and like a, I, I think it's like a reparation type thing. No one, for whatever reason, Congress gets weird about that kind of like paying people back about stuff, but. You know, it, it, can we go forward? Can we just stop putting people in jail, get people out, and just go forward? Because we can yeah. do that with this bill. The yeah, and the work actually does do some of the reparative justice measures, where like the tax that it includes in the, the in the bill, it's allowing for grant uh, grant programs that are aimed at you know community reinvestment. There's two grants that are meant to make the, the industry more equitable. One for states um, to pay for equitable licensing schemes, to pay for expungement. Um, and one for individuals who are economically and socially disadvantaged to enter the industry, to reduce financial barriers. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the tax in the bill is creating these grant programs. And so in a lot of, in a lot of ways, we successfully were, was able to establish, you know, reparative justice and at least in this, this angle. Did you look to other states when you were coming up with that? Because that sounds very similar to what we've done in Illinois. Yeah, I mean, you know, as states have continued to legalize, you know, the efforts have continued to get better at acknowledging, you know, the fact that we need to repair the harms of, you know, communities that have really been devastated by targeted policing and over enforcement of marijuana laws. Um, so, you know, it started with California with Prop 64, which has its issues. Um, but the intentions behind the campaign was, you know, to, to speak to the fact that communities have been harmed for decades and people continue to be harmed, you know? The collateral consequences of a marijuana conviction are, limitless especially if you're already a marginalized person like they really can impact your ability to get a job housing loans for education yeah like, that's right yeah because you, you can't get a mortgage you can't get a bank account yeah. you can't, do you have any idea how difficult it is for me to try to run my business on a day-to-day -day basis you have to play by a different rule and i don't even have to touch the plant so the people that are <laughs> actually getting hit by irc 280 e and you have to structure these so like, you know, why does it cost so much to operate in the cannabis space? Well, one of it is that you have to set up these very strange, almost hospital-like esque corporate <laughs> structures to try to avoid taxation by IRC 280E. I mean, it would be substantially less complicated uh, from a, 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 like a corporate governance type of standpoint if that wasn't a thing. Yeah, so I actually see in the comments someone asks, how do we figure out who's been over-policed? This is like not an opinionated thing. This is something that's backed by data. Um, I can refer you to the ACLU's latest report that did a whole bunch of analysis down to county level of arrest data. These are documented offenses that the government has been doing that racially targeted um, arrest and enforcement of marijuana laws. It's down to the zip code. Um, yeah. So these are documented. Issues. How many people have been arrested? What's the data set? What's the sample size on this data set that we're talking about? So over the decades, there's been millions of people, obviously, but every millions. year it's about over 600,000 people who are arrested every year. Um, despite equal rates of use across race, we see nationally that black people are four times more likely to be arrested. And in certain, and when you look down in jurisdictions, it's as high as 10 or 10 times as likely as we see in DC. Um, so, you know, racial disparities are very real in marijuana yeah. arrests. And I definitely implore folks to, Take a look yeah. at the research. Like you said, it's definitely about zip code. Like here in Washington State, I feel safer consuming my cannabis and driving my car and being a brown man, opposed to going through Idaho. It's real. It's real. Yep. 
It is. And then like the thing is, it, it's in the numbers. I mean, you can lie and cheat and steal and argue as much as you want. This is a data set. These are checked boxes from actual instances of arrest in the millions. And then if you look at the numbers in like charts and graphs, you'll be like, well, damn. Just, right. just damn, you know? It's and egregious. Then, it's well, egregious. Like, yeah, yeah. It's not even a conversation. There are horrible racial disparities in arrest period, and especially in marijuana arrest. And the war on drugs has definitely had disproportionate impact on communities of color and low income communities. That's a point blank um, point. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Be dark skin and have dreadlocks. I'm going to pull you over. Well, not only that, they, they reduce it down to like smell. Oh, I don't like the smell of something right. going on over here. I can get into your shit and start causing trouble. Right. We saw Philando Castillo got shot down in his car because of the smell in his car. You know, the assumption that a cop could fear for his life because someone's car smells like weed. You know, or, or about Shonda. They said uh, she had marijuana yeah. in her system. That's why she went nuts. I mean, are you, are you yeah. kidding me? Yeah, Breonna T Taylor died because of a warrant that was meant to, you know, investigate drugs. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so it's kind of a, a warrant. <laughs> right. it's black. It is, but then okay. there's there's this abject lack of empathy with a certain a certain amount of people in the world where they just feel like it makes them feel bad to try to acknowledge that because it hurts them, and they just won't. And then you're just like yeah. talking to a post, and then that almost might be like endemic as our population or as a species, because like, if you watch a movie from like 40, 50 years ago, or like hear like a speech about it, you're like, damn, have we, have we changed at all? Just like at all. It's the only thing that's changing. We now have better toys. Is that it? You know? Yeah. Right. The, the yeah. fact that black life matter triggers a bunch of people. Are you kidding me? Right. Yeah. It's it's pretty sad, but I will say in Congress, at least um, for a lot of members who still struggle with, you know, their perceptions of marijuana, they still think marijuana is a gateway drug. The civil rights arguments, the justice reform arguments really made a headway for people. They were able to at least put away or work through their drug stigma separate from supporting legalization. I just wonder if those people ever leave the house. Yeah. Nobody <laughs> leaves the house anymore, Miggy. Work from home, bro. <laughs> There is the COVID is thick out there. COVID is like a 9-11 a day right now. We're okay. having a 9-11 a day. Yeah. And then I mean, it's just like, damn, yeah. you know? I mean, the before times though, right? Like people who say this is a gateway drug, like have you not seen the streets? Like most of these people who are drug addicts, it's not like I smoked a joint and all of a sudden my life's a ray, you know? And even cannabis consumers, when I see them, people who, some people just don't have, uh, moderation where they can consume and they're like, okay, I'm going to blame the weed because I'm going to sit on my ass all day. And, and, and you know, that's what I want to do, but I don't do it. <laughs> Either know? way, you shouldn't. People shouldn't go to jail for it. Either way, exactly. it's not it. yeah. no one's business how often you're smoking in your house. You know, it's really no one's business. Exactly. <laughs> right. As long as you're not harming people. Well, Which I quit it. Yeah, well, th that's the thing, you know. Remember that once, because and then when you look at the uh, the nonsense from the newspapers that actually were responsible partially for its actual prohibition from like the 30s, and you're like, and he went into a terrible, bloodthirsty rage and axe murdered everybody's, and you're like, with all the personal experience and exposure and knowledge that I have of cannabis use, I've never seen that happen once. I've seen this. <laughs> And the energy that, at least speaking from a person who works for DPA and just like the policy reform as myself, my energy behind marijuana reform and, you know, just the need for the government to stop criminalizing people extends to all substances. I believe that the war on drugs is really ex like exacerbating the harm of drug use, period. And oh, yeah. it's worsening the overdose crisis. Like people should not be in jail for using drugs. People should not be in jail for using drugs, for having problematic use, regardless if they smoke weed or if they use meth. So oh, yeah. the energy is the same across the board. I like to say uh, America has the uh, the preacher daughter syndrome. You know, like she's cooped up all the time. And then when she gets out and sees the real world, she's all like, let's do it all. <laughs> <laughs> I preacher mean, daughter syn uh, uh, syndrome of America. I guess that that might be a thing. I mean, we do raise our children to believe in Santa Claus. So who knows? Yeah. I mean, the fact that we got the president we deserve at this point right now, because this ignorant, dumb motherfucker who <laughs> doesn't have any success as a businessman, but he's sold to 74 million people that he's an actual businessman. It's it's our Instagram culture. It's our, let me. People make decisions. Hey. Remember how I said, if you look at the charts and the graphs and the data, it's 
freaking obvious. That doesn't matter. Like people that use that, like myself, to make decisions, we're in the insular minority. Most people feel their facts. And so because they're feeling their facts, they don't have to really, dis they, they don't have to, they can say everything's fake just so they can get back to what they originally thought and felt in the first place. That's why we can't have nice things. It's human. I'm just saying though, like, you know, we, we're so focused on this us them bullshit. Like, you know, we're not trying to pound on the Republicans. I really don't give a fuck what party you're a part of. Like, if you're pro, goddamn Matt Gates yeah, voted for you. Jesus Christ! My own, a, a, a Democrat from two counties over that I've given money to voted against it. I'm like, what the heck? And so, like, I can say that it's 97 percent against in Republicans, and then and then what happens? My own representative uh, votes with the Republicans on this because they don't understand what the plant is, and uh, you know, the education aspect of the plant is just. It's going to take decades, man. And so that's, uh, let's get back to like a, a mythical world that's like maybe three-ish years into the future where the MORE Act actually does pass because that's when things are going to change and laws take a while to go into effect and ha hammer out. How long, uh, Queen, was the draft of the MORE Act? How many pages? It ended up being, I believe, in the 60s. Or if it's 60 plus, the tax provision, the tax provision is really, you know, <laughs> lengthening the bill. Um, but the process to, you know, get this bill to where we saw it on Friday took at least, you know, over a year. But in the hindsight of things, that's not a long time in the space of federal policy and moving, you know, reform in, in Congress. Mm -hmm. So, you know, just speaking to someone who said in the chat, like, why are we even talking about this if it's not going to pass the Senate? This... I can't und I can't underscore like as much than this that Congress is really difficult to navigate. Moving reforms and Congress is difficult to navigate. We barely see bills pass in either chambers. So it's really historic. It's really we can't forget how significant it is that this Congress even considered three different bills, including one that actually ends criminalization. This is gonna bring us to a place where we actually can start um at a place where we actually started ending criminalization. Um, we're not having to negotiate with the States Act. We're not having to still talk about whether or not we should legalize. We're past the point of should we legalize. It's more of how should we do it? You know, how should the taxes um, be set up? How should we account for expungement and resentencing? That's really where we are now. Right. I think the, 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 the descheduling will help. Um, like, you know, we want to focus all the assistance on uh, the, the communities that have been hurt, the disproportionate, you know, communities. But in the end, and once it's descheduled, because this, even though everybody's eyes is not going to be perfect, it can still get worked on and structured once it passes through, right? Just like here in Washington, we're not all happy right away, but it's still getting worked out, like policy-wise and whatnot. Um, and but it will give everybody, black, white, brown, yellow, green, whatever, mm -hmm. a chance to just plant a seed and see how this thing works and grows and what it does and how they can interface with it in an industry. That's not in the more act. Now, how much regulate is there license type one contemplated in the more act? So the bill does establish a federal permit system. So you would have to get licensed in your state and then you also have to get a federal permit. Um, I will say though, that the regulatory piece, like this bill was not supposed to really address regulations because Theoretically, if we end criminalization, we deschedule, states that are that have legalized are already regulating and states that have it criminalized are criminalizing it. So it's not like this void that, you know, we would have to deal with. Oh, like, come maybe. on, Queen. Are you a lawyer? Uh, no. <laughs> okay. Well, let me give you the lawyer's answer then. As soon as that happens, I, there's going to be an equal protection claim filed in the state of Indiana that says, how come my activity in this state is a crime, but in that over there, it is lawful. And there is a federal regulation to get a permit for this. This is an unconstitutional oh. law and this criminalization has to end. Well, that's actually lawsuits might take federalism. Yeah. Um, states can choose their own policies. Descheduling doesn't legalize it in all the states. Descheduling just allows states to choose their own policy. And the bill encourages states to legalize by offering money to do certain things, but states can absolutely continue to criminalize. So the work on the state level, the MORE Act is sure just addressing federal issues, yeah. but states 
states are not required to legalize marijuana. It's based on, you know, the support of the people, what's happening in the state legislature. And those um, lawsuits will take five, 10 years. And so, hey, if you're watching this in 2025 and you're like, how do I file an equal protection lawsuit in the state to like, you know, invalidate that? You may have found that on Cannabis Legalization News. So uh, tune in then, yeah. But you know, the uh, expert- either way, the goal was never to, the goal, we know what's happening in the Senate. The Senate is barely taking up the bank bill and that's like, you know, a Band-Aid. So oh, yeah. no one was under the impression that, you know, this, the Senate was actually gonna take up more. The real goal and the real hump that we had to get over was the House, which is something that we managed to do this Congress. So hopefully, depending on what happens in Georgia, um, we may actually have a better shot next in next Congress to really move this along the Senate as well. And right. it helps that the Senate lead of the Morag is now the Vice President-elect. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll see. No doubt. Uh, and you know, but when I, when I say it gives everybody a chance to plant a seed, I, the expectation is going to be Kind of like when medical happens in all the states, right? Mm-hmm. Cops stop arresting. They start, you know, they prioritize like counties. You know, that's going to be the state version of it. Of uh, uh, okay, we're going to arrest you today or not. And then that's where Tom's uh, lawsuits come into play because once uh, you arrest me, now we got bigger issues. Yeah. And uh, just speaking to the last point, um, something that I actually just saw in the comment that I think is actually true. Um, a lot of states have not moved to legalize because their main excuse is that it's illegal on the federal level. And we're gonna see why sweeping movement to legalize. And again, if we actually have a bill that incentivizes legalizing, provides money for states to do these things, um, we're gonna know. see the end of prohibition. And it's good. It, well, why was it such a partisan vote then? It was more of a, a partisan vote because of the comprehensive approach of the MORE Act. I mean, the bill passed progressive immigration policy. It's like there's a whole section on non-citizens, you know, there's a whole section on public benefits to make sure that people won't be denied food stamps for marijuana use or previous conviction. Like it was not just about ending prohibition. And for some people, they don't agree with that strategy because a, a descheduling bill by itself, you know, theoretically might have been more bipartisan. A, a clean just research bill might have been more bipartisan. But if we're going to end prohibition, we have to do it in this in a way that's accountable to, you know, the impact of the policies. Um, and that's why we intentionally wanted it to be comprehensive and address all of these things, despite the fact that a lot of these other things are not as bipartisan as this marijuana policy. By itself. Hmm. Well, that does make sense, considering how many benefits and programs and, and other things that was getting done in the MORE Act. Uh, you think yeah. that's going to be... Is that going to is that going to be the way that it goes? Or is it going to become like a MORE Act light where it's just decriminalize. I mean, that's not our intention, speaking for at least the lead advocates on in the front in the front ground the here. Like, yeah, we want yeah. it to, to be in this way. I mean, it's not as, you know, it's not something that people think is strategic because of the long, how much longer it might take and how much work we have to do to educate people on all the issues right. that we're trying to educate people on. But it's the right thing to do. <laughs> so, you know, it, it would be really silly to legalize marijuana on the federal level and then have people still sitting in prison. For it. Oh, you know, yeah. it's just, I mean, so what that <laughs> Congress, we have to do more work. It's important that we do that. So um, that is the, the intentions behind at least the folks who are leading the Marijuana Justice Coalition to make sure that we're continuing to lead with that lens. But, you know, for example, our, our only Republican co-sponsor, Matt Gates, who is a piece of shit, honestly, <laughs> but... Um, you know, he he would consistently shit on the reparations, as he calls it, reparations pieces of the bill. You know, he prefers his marijuana policies not dipped in reparations policy. But, um, you know, it's ridiculous to think about marijuana reform through a colorblind lens. It just does not make sense in the U.S. It, 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 it's, it seems like the, the, the 97 percent of the Republicans who voted against this act feel that we should be sex class citizens, period. Like we're not equal because we believe and, and these are the same group that believe in all Jesus. the exploitation for the past 80 years all of it all of us yeah. using the smell uh, and like any instance that we could use to to get at this plant to just totally derail your life and then the data bear, bears that out we shouldn't have to account for that at all that should right. just be the past you know and let's be clear the origins of the war on drugs and the war on marijuana did not come from a sincere place of like oh we need to address this public health issue and you know we no, just- it was 
Change Get the right. name of it so the doctors don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> Publish fake articles in the news. Get a guy who is very serious looking to testify uh, to uh, the Democrats were actually in favor of it back uh, 87, whatever years ago now. And, and that's how they got it pushed through. So, I mean, it was a byproduct of its time and its time's gone, you know, and then it's, it's just not enough to say, OK, moving on. You know, yeah. uh, We've wasted billions of dollars. Uh, oh so my countless lives. I mean, if we, we can't even quantify, you know, if you really think about the individual, the countless people who have been impacted by this on like on a personal level, the amount of people who have been deported for this, the amount of people who like, you know, have lost their children over marijuana. Like we can't even quantify the devastation. So it, it's it's hard to, you know, fall into the trap of we need to like think about this later or like you should not talk about this part. We should just talk about the plan. You know, it's really hard not to do that. And when we talk about veterans, for example, the fact that so many veterans are going without legal access to medical cannabis is offensive. Yes. Um, so, yeah. Full like, stop. No, it is completely offensive. I mean, like, I realized that you didn't understand how this plant worked until the early 90s. I get it. That's when we found, well, it's true. I mean, like, that's when the, the endocannabinoid system was discovered by Mitchell in Israel. Fine. That was 27 freaking years ago. Why haven't you gotten with the times? Uh, why did you continue to injure these people in the 90s, today, in the 2000s? You know, <laughs> you knew. Yeah. My favorite part is when they say that we can't legalize it right now because it's not enough research. But really, marijuana's Schedule One status and controlled substance status is why we don't have research like that. Too. Oh, that, that, that's that's well, here's yeah, the next scene. Yeah, but there there is an absolute chutzpah on the we need more research uh, uh, canard, and it literally is a canard. And it, the canard is a very not quite well known aspect of the Controlled Substances Act that was required to be put in there so the Democrat enough Democrats would go along with it. And that was like part F of the Controlled Substances Act, which commissioned a a study, a federal effing study, like the Mueller report. It was called the Schaefer Commission. And they issued a report in like 71 or 72 that said, mm -hmm. this was a mistake. It should be decriminalized based on our federal research that we did. Thrown in the garbage by Dick Nixon, continued to invade Cambodia. Dude, even in our legal state, look at this guy. Uh, going to court tomorrow for one plant here in Illinois. One, one plant, plant over the line. One in the legal state. And then the, the, these are semantics, right? One yeah. plant numbers. It, this is all bullshit regulation that. Bullshit. Yeah. I mean, education. Well, policy. I mean, uh, Illinois hopefully will have an amendment to what the definition of plant is to make it a mature plant. And so that's the one of the things. Like right now, the plant definition is if it's over five inches, it counts as a plant. And I'm like, that's hilarious. A five inch plant is just a matter of a few weeks old. It has no, you can't tell what it Maybe is. Some? You know, and then that, that five inch plant, if you have six of those, sudden, suddenly, suddenly, no. And so we're, we're trying to get the definition changed to mature plants. And then you define that. And so then if you would have had like six big flowering behemoths, you'd be like, hey, bro, five's not enough, you know? I mean, well, <laughs> <laughs> I, I feel you, Queen. Like sometimes we, we're having this conversation. It's like, why are we even having this conversation, right? Like we're defending our our existence like why why are we going through the uh, uh, 1920s backwards thinking like there's this damn us versus them mentality that we keep re, re uh, visiting uh i watched the uh, pbs the uh the Re reconstruction right mm -hmm. seemed like america was getting their shit together right after civil war all right we're gonna treat everybody equal and then the races take over again it comes back down and and then eventually this we get the drug policy right now we're gonna yeah control those people that, right but now it's everybody equal the problem with the american dream is the american dream includes everybody it's not just those first settlers back in the day and, and, and we gotta give everybody a chance and and, and not stop incarcerating treating us like third world citizens for believing in a plant when they believe in white jesus or you know <laughs> Treating it as a <laughs> and don't forget, if you work really, really hard and cheat just enough, you too can become a millionaire. Just saying, it'll give everybody a chance as an American, you know, and then we can export not the prohibition, but the the success that we have. You know, what, what what's the uh, uh, the bills coming through right now for assistance? They're, they're like about a billion, right? 
The Saragon? Oh, for how much money it would create? Oh, for coming up to help right now that's passing through the House and Senate for the CARES Act and all that stuff, oh, right? right? Yeah. You know, and, and in the beginning of this year, billions were raised by individual states and just the cannabis taxes. You can't tell me that this plant, if we were to deschedule it, will not help society in a whole, our society, our war, our America. I mean, you got... Yeah. Man, the, the, the Congressional Budget Office came out with a report on Monday um, that quantified the the MORE Act would actually amount to $13.7 billion in revenue for the federal government. It would save $1 billion in prison spending. It would save 73,000 prison years, like person years, and like currently incarcerated and future incarcerated people. Like, you know, completely <laughs> fucking the, uh, the karma of America to the tune <laughs> of thousands of years. It doesn't make any sense. I mean, you know, the cure for cancer could have been saved by now, but that guy's probably in jail right now. Yeah. No. <laughs> yeah and or we just, instead of, you know, diverting money to things that actually make sense, we've been spending money to enforce these laws that do not make sense. Yeah. yeah. And that's one of the reasons that I'm really looking forward to Biden's pick for the attorney general. And I'm also <laughs> looking forward to the Congress's bu and Biden's budget and regarding the defunding of the DEA and the Department of Justice from enforcing any state hemp or marijuana law. Mm -hmm. uh, because now we have states that are like, and then the, those USDA rules were just cataclysmically bad. And then there's litigation to try to iron those out. So if, if the Department of Justice is helping the, the plant as opposed to continuing to frustrate it, that's going to be huge. I mean, I think that's why it's important that the more I pass the House, because we now have a precedent that a, the, a congressional body actually voted to do this. Um, and it's clear that, you know, the nation is going a certain way. Congress is so behind where people are. I mean, we've been seeing support for legalization continue to rise every year. It's continued to be an all time high every year. All time um, highs. Yeah, it's great. I mean, it's great. People, Oregon, hey, for joining us, drugs, but right? did, you know, Queen is in a legal uh, jurisdiction of DC. I'm legal over in Illinois. Maybe, legal, yeah. Wait, wait, are you in DC or are you somewhere else? No, I'm in DC, but it's barely legal here. It's like half legal. It's legal it. enough. You can grow it. You can give it. And then Miggy, it's legal over in uh, uh, Washington state. Is it better where it's legal? Just an informal poll. My ass is less puckered. Oh, dude, I feel way better. I am growing plants <laughs> over there. It's fine. Yeah. It's definitely better, but I can't. I can't lie. Like DC's in a weird. DC's in a weird place because of statehood. But yeah. when I go to California, it's amazing. I feel like you know, folks are spoiled. <laughs> you get to walk into so. yeah a store. <laughs> but you have to buy like three dollars stickers in DC. Yeah, you. It's a whole different process. You have to like, gift and you know exchange, and it's all. It's a gray market. Yeah, it's still kind of shitty crazy. artists out there. Like, oh, would you like? To, uh, I just drew this. Forty dollars. Yeah, like, Fifty dollars <laughs> stocks. Fifty dollars stocks. I can get you some weed. It's <laughs> it's not the legalization model that I was envisioning. Yeah. No, but. I don't. I, I like that you're able to gift, and I think you should be able to gift up to your possession limits. I'm not the biggest fan of possession limits, um, yeah. but you know, if you're going to try to sell weed. You should have a license. There needs to be purity in that weed. You know, you just it, people are proud of their home grow. I wouldn't mind selling mine, but it would it would that would be illegal, of course. But then at least you know what's in it. And so, um, but I think if you want to sell it, you need to have that license. I, yeah, I think we just need to do a good job at making sure licenses are accessible. Yeah. Um, they're not like huge fees because the point is like you know it's no, unfair to legalize and have financial yeah. barriers. Well, I mean, so you mean I shouldn't be able to charge like eighty to a hundred thousand dollars per application just to do that application because it's a crazy thing, like in Illinois or New Jersey or uh, exactly. or Georgia. <laughs> that's you good. Thank you. That's that's well. I mean, uh, again, I feel terrible. Like, no, this this application is going to be about fourteen hundred pages long because of all the regulations you have to comply with. Yeah. And uh, no, I'm sorry, that's going to take me hours per page and. The, the going market rate for the, the consultants in this is between like 80,000 and 120,000 dollars for that license type. You know, it's crazy. Yeah, because we now have a world where people who were in policy positions opposing marijuana can leave the policy space and just make millions of dollars. Yeah. Here. <laughs> and, you know, it's unfair, unfair that that can happen. And that's something that um, as an advocate at the forefront, I'm hoping to 
avoid well, as much as if possible. You're, if you're an advocate at the forefront for that possibility, make sure that then you regulate and decentralize the cultivation of it. Because if you can regulate and decentralize the cultivation of it, then it's production. I mean, you've separated the, the, the production from like, you know, the warehousing and then the economies of scale. Uh, for the license types, if there's there's stuff that you can do that way, because I mean, like the thing about the plant or or anything, like you have to make it. It's like a it's like a restaurant. Like you know, you have to literally make the plant. And so because of that, uh, and with the way that licenses can work, uh, it can be a very decentralized, hyper local approach. What about it being like tobacco though? Like right now, I can grow my own tobacco, but I mean, this is like 2030, right? <laughs> like more <laughs> passes next year. Everybody slowly evolves, you know, and then one day we all go to our 7-Elevens and buy our an eighth of weed, pre-roll or not, pending. <laughs> I think there's a lot of ways that marijuana is similar to tobacco, and a lot of people even try to say it's similar to, or people suggest that it should be similar to how alcohol is regulated, but the plant is so unique. It's so different from those things, too, because of the medical benefits and, like, you know, what are the opportunities that we want to look into for medical advances and what are the implications of marijuana being considered a, a medicine versus, you know, a recreational kind of vice or whatever, you know, like there, there are going to be implications on the regulations in terms of how this is going to be treated. If it ends up being like, you know, regulated as a medicine, it might impact access, just, you know, regular access. So there's a lot of unanswered questions and untapped territory, even in for marijuana policy experts, you know, we haven't gotten this far before. Yeah. So we're literally it's creating first day. something. Yeah. We are kind of making this industry up on yeah. a day by day basis. Yeah. Yeah. Literally. So um, and at least I'm not I'm not actually a capitalist. So um navigating how to make a capitalist system fair and equitable that you know is not the case is really difficult. Um, but uh, you, you go into the legislation, which actually gives <laughs> rise to these corporate entities, which are not people, by the way, they're just a whole bunch of contracts. And then you insert <laughs> into their particular social equity provisions that would then uh, remake what the corporate fiduciaries are, and therefore they have to comply with them. <laughs> okay, we saved capitalism, everybody. <laughs> it turns out it, it's a lot more difficult than even that. <laughs> but, I know, I was being yeah. <laughs> Well, I think it's, the people. Okay. Oh no, I was gonna say it's an exciting time to be in the drug policy space because we're making a lot of movement, but it's a very difficult time, and the the stakes are high. So there's a lot of pressure um, to get this right, and you know, a lot of pressure, rightfully so, to not fuck over people who are continually fucked over. Right. So, right. And I think the people's dismay, though, you're not sitting there writing a sixty-page policy going. All right, I think. Uh, Actually, I'm a very proud uh, marijuana user. I've used marijuana my whole life. Uh, so I think it's important to be clear and transparent that like marijuana users are people in all spaces. Functional. Um, yeah. <laughs> so they're usually quite healthy, yeah. you know, I've, and the, a lot of the ones that I've met are also kind of smart. So they're smart, healthy I people. Myself. Yeah. <laughs> they usually have pretty good taste, you know. Uh, yeah, you know, and as as it becomes to be more normalized um, and more accessible, when people start to offer, you know, CBD cream to their older folks in their lives to slap on their knees, and you know, it becomes more normalized, and in our communities, it'll become the the stigma will become to decrease. Yeah. We're just yeah. like living in a really socialized environment where we're think like a lot of people still think that marijuana and the weed is like scary and does all these horrible things. It's just a political education problem. And that's what we're trying to do to politicize people to see that, you know, see what we see already as people who are familiar with the truth. <laughs> so. Queen, thank you so much for joining us today. Where can we go to find and follow what you guys got going on at the Drug Policy Alliance? Uh, I would follow us on Twitter, Drug Policy Org. Um, that's our handle. And um, just visit our website, drugpolicy.org. Um, you can look, find, sign up to our, our newsletter. We send lots of updates, lots of action alerts to get people involved. Um, lots of people were, are responsible. It's not just the advocates on the ground, but the people who reached out to their congressmen and their congresswoman, like that has been really instrumental. Um, so, you know, we have tens of twenties of thousands of people to thank um, for taking action. Um, people think that those things don't matter, but they tally up, offices tally up outreach, you know, and that actually has an impact on getting people to support. So I really appreciate that. Awesome. Thank you so much for joining us again. And thanks for tuning in, everyone. Make sure you like and subscribe to keep up with all cannabis legalization news. We will see you on Sunday.
Thanks, Queen. Thank you. Thank you. Take it easy. Be safe.